Great. Well, I think we are going to get started. Thank you again to everyone being here for our inaugural session of our Accelerating Climate Resiliency Speaker Series. We're very excited to be kicking off this event with Dr. Linda Shi, who will be presenting on sea level rise and underwater municipal budgets. My name is Cami Peterson. I'm our Director of Clean Energy at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And MAPC, for those who aren't familiar, are at we're the regional planning agency for the 101 cities and towns of Greater Boston. We're a public agency that was formed over 50 years ago by the state's legislature, and we work toward our mission of smart growth, regional coordination, centering equity, and addressing climate change. And you'll see how many of those issues interact in the, the program that we'll be discussing and this presentation here today. First, I'll walk through some logistics about the, the, the speaker that we're going to have today, how this session is going to be run, and then we'll get into more about the Accelerating Climate Resiliency Program and be able to turn it over to Linda for her excellent presentation. Ella, you can go on to the next slide. Just to make sure that everyone is familiar with the logistics that we'll be using here, some housekeeping. We've all now been at these video platforms for well over um, a year or at least somewhat over a year, and so our fluency with Zoom has gotten better and better. Just so that folks know how we're going to be working with this, with the, the platform today, everyone will remain on mute, um, but there'll be opportunities throughout the presentation to enter questions in the chat box. So we encourage you to do so. Then when we get through the presentation, there will be time for a question and answer session where we'll be able to select questions out of that chat box to ask Linda and hear her responses on. Um, so we encourage you to do that, but we will be keeping everyone on mute otherwise in order to allow everyone to be able to hear the presentation in the best way possible. Um, we also do reserve the right to expel anyone at any point, though I don't expect there to be any disruptions or any issues, um, but just in case there are any, um, we'll proceed as, as noted. And you can go on to the next slide. I think you all probably heard when you entered the meeting, but this meeting is being recorded. You are welcome to turn off your camera if you'd prefer not to be recorded. You're also welcome, of course, to exit the, the session at any time. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that everyone understood um, that, that the session is being recorded so that we can share it with, with your peers and others throughout the region, throughout the state, and in case anyone here would like to revisit it again. We'll make it publicly available for that reason. You can go on to the next slide. So let me tell everyone a little bit more about this speaker series and this program. So at MAPC, we've been running for the last couple of years with the generous funding of the Barr Foundation, a program called Accelerating Climate Resiliency. We've been working in partnership with the Barr Foundation to accelerate climate resilience in the region by helping municipalities advance strategies that protect people, places, and communities from the impacts of climate change. We do that through a number of ways. So that a large part of our program is a grant program where we've worked with many of your cities and towns and, and hope to do more so in the future in order to fund actionable resilience interventions that facilitate long-term innovative changes leading to greater readiness for climate change. We're really seeking to elevate projects and to discuss issues that advance climate equity, regional coordination, and social cohesion. And one of the other ways that we're doing that is through a new resilience community of practice in which we bring the grantees together to work on in a peer-to-peer -peer manner on knowledge sharing, best practices, and discussing challenges. It's a new program that we're, we're really excited about and we think will really bring some benefits to those grantees and some learnings that can be disseminated and scaled across the region. Another part of that, of that program is our new speaker series. So as I mentioned, this is our first in the events that we hope to come. We expect these to be on a bi-monthly basis. So you'll see at the end of our session today, we already have a very exciting speaker booked for our next session at the end of May. And we hope you'll join us for that too. And for the many other speakers that we bring to everyone over the course of the next year. We're excited to be able to bring experts and practitioners across the country who can speak to how they are really perceiving and advancing climate resilience. With that, I want to transition to welcoming our first speaker today, a friend of MAPC's, Dr. Linda Shi. I've known Linda for a while, it was several years ago when she was in the Boston area working on her PhD that she participated in our Metro Mayor's Coalition Climate Preparedness Task Force on somewhat similar topics to those that she'll be discussing today. It was great to have her expertise added to that discussion and dialogue and wonderful to stay in touch with her over the years and see the great work that she's advancing. 
Linda now, as I mentioned, is, is no longer pursuing her PhD. She has moved on to being an assistant professor at Cornell University's Department of City and Regional Planning. There she studies barriers to coastal climate adaptation, how cities are adapting, and the impacts of their adaptation effects on social and spatial inequity and inequality across the global north and south. Her research aims to reveal how current institutions contribute to unjust and unsustainable adaptation in order to enable policy reforms that redress underlying causes of societal vulnerability to climate change. A really relevant topic to all of those that we are, are really looking to address through our program and hopefully to most of you here today. And we've really seen how many different impacts of climate change can affect communities in different ways and how that those are really just ex being exacerbated both by COVID and over the course of time as climate change worsens. Sea level rise is certainly one that our coastal communities are feeling acutely, and not just in the impacts on the environment, but certainly on their budgets as well. This can sometimes be a sensitive topic as we talk through the approaches that communities can take to address sea level rise itself and the, all of the ancillary effects of it. Um, so we, we are looking forward to a very respectful conversation and question period, and are really excited to hear more about the research that Linda has been doing. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Linda Shi. Thanks so much, Cami. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I know that everyone is on their computer and on Zoom so much these days, and I'm grateful that you're choosing to spend your lunch hour here with me. Um, let me share my slides here. And Ella, if you can let me know if you're able to see what I'm showing. We are, Linda. Great, thanks so much. Um, I also wanted to give the land acknowledgement of where I'm coming from today. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayugano or the Cayuga Nation, uh, and Cornell University and I acknowledge the painful history of Cayugano dispossession and honor the ongoing connection to Cayugano people past and present to these lands and waters. And I also want to acknowledge the shootings that have taken place in Atlanta and in Boulder, and I know that so much, uh, so many people on top of the COVID and economic impact impacts are hurting. Many of you, if you're working in your municipalities as leaders and local, local leaders, um, you're bearing a lot of the brunt of things that are happening now. So again, I'm in solidarity with all of you wherever you are, whatever you might be feeling, and uh, just grateful that we are all here today and thankful to um, Cami and MAPC for organizing this wonderful talk. So today I'm going to be talking about sea level rise and the impacts that it has to municipal budgets. I think that uh, obviously MAPC has been in the leadership role of conducting climate adaptation assessments for a long time and others, uh, the Boston Harbor Association among many have been con considering the impacts of sea level rise and climate change to the region for a long time. Um, but very interestingly, these, these kinds of assessments have tended to look at the physical conditions, right? So if you superimpose a sea level rise on top of a physical landscape, what are the physical assets, infrastructure, houses that are going to be impacted? And then more, rec more recently, people have also been paying attention to the social impacts. So what are the socioeconomic conditions, the linguistic age, um, all sorts of different conditions of people who live in these uh, in areas that will be impacted. But at the end of the day, the primary entity that appears to be the target of implementation is the local government. And the primary uh, response that local electeds have is to their budgets. Right. Local governments are responsible for keeping the health and safety and well-being of their residents, and maybe second to that is to maintain the budget. And so if you talk to any mayor, town manager, or local planner in, uh, trying to respond to their elected officials, that is going to be the chief prerogative of how they uh, how they zone, how they permit, what kinds of decisions and plans they make. And so as more and more people begin to think about how do we get people to change what's happening in floodplains and coastal zones, how do we encourage managed retreat, we have to be really cognizant of the realities of the broader policies that currently have, that historically have shaped how cities have developed and what are the context facing decision making today. So I've written about this in the Boston Globe and others have as well. And it's kind of interesting to me as somebody who's been interested in the issue of um, equity and justice that most people, you know, I, I recently have been editing a special volume that invited abstracts. We received 63 abstracts about, you know, transformative climate change, planning for 
climate transformation was the title of this. And probably about half of those were about equity and justice and social vulnerability and the indicators and how are cities integrating these things. And we got maybe one or two that were about land, property rights, uh, land policy, uh, those kinds of things. And that seems to be somewhat more mundane, somewhat more boring. And yet those are the underlying policies that shape whether or not you can actually achieve just uh, outcomes in cities. And so I think that we really need to be thinking about both uh, from a practical consideration, you know, what our electeds respond to, as well as the ambitious goals for justice and climate change and climate justice, that we have to address the issue of land policy and fiscal policy. So in terms of the impacts, you know, if you were going to do a fiscal impact analysis of climate change, basically any municipal budget has two pieces to it. One is the revenue side and one is the expenditure side, uh, very, very generally speaking. And so in terms of the climate impacts that it could have to a budget, right, on the revenue side, a major storm like five feet of snow is going to disrupt businesses that leads to reduced business taxes, uh, commercial taxes. It could also have a direct economic impacts to climate dependent businesses like fisheries or tourism or recreation, again, reducing taxes, uh, you might attract less development or businesses might choose to relocate. Maybe GE decides not to come here or Amazon decides not to settle in your place and goes to somewhere else. Um, and then the residents themselves may have declining ability to pay various forms of user fees and charges and, ta uh, and taxes. And then the property values themselves may decline. That leads to declining property tax rules. On the expenditure side, if you have a major disaster or preparing for them, there are expenses that now you have to consider. How do you begin to retrofit the health and hospitals? How do you provide welfare and disaster response and emergency preparedness? There's a lot of whether it is uh, heat that causes road buckling or hurricanes that causes roads to uh, collapse, or sometimes it's rising water tables. All sorts of different kinds of climate impacts affect the speed uh, at which infrastructure depreciates the kinds of maintenance and repair costs. There might be also increasing capital improvement costs if you have to build a new seawall, elevate a road, uh, put infrastructure on a roof from the basement, all sorts of those kinds of costs, increasing the size of the pipes, which MWRA has done. Um, and then, of course, there's the rising cost of lending because a number of the bond rating agencies are beginning to are just beginning to take into account uh, climate impacts to how they rate the bonds. And so if your bond ratings begin to fall because of your climate risk impacts, that's going to increase the cost of lending. So today I'm just going to focus chiefly on the issue of property values because this is a bit easier to model and to assess compared to some of the others. And I am not an economist. And so this is, uh, this is uh, about what my pay grade allows me to do. So when you look at municipal property taxes, everybody who's working at the local government level is very cognizant of own source revenues, the revenues that a municipality can uh, come up with themselves, and property taxes comprise an important part of that. So on average, across the country, local governments, uh, for local governments, 30% of their revenues come from property taxes. Massachusetts and other New England states, that tends to be a bit higher, it's 40%. Coastal municipalities in Massachusetts it's even higher at 60%. And there are some bedroom suburbs that are chiefly reliant on property taxes that can be 70 to 80% uh, of those fees. So you can begin to imagine that if we're talking about um, climate change, having impacts to property values, which the markets are beginning to reflect that, the, the properties um, are either not growing as fast in value or some of them begin to decline in value, especially after disaster or property or um, Flood insurance also has a direct impact on reduced um, property values. All of that then, and then finally buyouts, efforts to remove and engage a manager retreat, that will all uh, impact property taxes. So the more property tax reliant you are, the more that um, any impact to that property tax will is going to be significant and worrisome. So on the one hand, you have a lot of people saying, 
we should be planning for climate change, we should be doing vulnerability assessments. And we have been rolling that out. So Massachusetts now requires some municipal vulnerability assessments for everybody to do. And if you look at this map of Inner Harbor, Boston, and the surrounding municipalities, all of these places have a vulnerability assessment. Some of them now also have a climate action and resilience plan. And all of them have also cited their most prominent de uh, developments in places that are currently in the floodplain and are going to be underwater with six, six feet of sea level rise. Right. And I remember, I'm not going to quote who, but one of these, the planners from one of these communities uh, said to me, and he's he's here on the call, um, said to me, you know, are you going to tell me that I can't develop in this once in a lifetime opportunity? How can I tell my mayor not to do that? Because then we can't generate the revenues that we need to provide affordable housing to the rest of our municipality. And if I say no, because you have to elevate, you know, you have to tell this developer you need to put in so much fill to elevate elevate the development five feet off the current base, then that developer is going to say, screw you, I can go to the next town and they are not going to have that requirement and I will lose that development and who is going to be gaining from that, right? So we have this conundrum where we know the climate risks and it appears to have very little impact on our development choices. So it's not necessarily about political awareness, political commitment. There are other factors, including our fiscal reliance on property taxes that I think shape a lot of decision making. We also did an analysis of the um, property taxes that could be lost and total taxes that could be lost with sea level rise. This is a fairly crude uh, assessment. This is not highly nuanced or localized. Um, it's mainly just a bathtub layer of sea level rise over existing property values. And so when you look at this, what it shows is, um, for, I would say, first of all, if you look at the left map, this is total revenues. Yeah, so the, how much of the total municipal budget is jeopardized by sea Level rise on account of lost property taxes. So in the dark brown, you'll see it goes from 10 to 25 percent. And as a share of the tax levy, it goes up 20 to 43 percent in the dark red here. And what you'll notice here is, of course, that the inner core of Boston, because it's built on fill, has the greatest impact, but that across the, the coastline, it is very unequal and uneven impact. So this is even at six feet of sea level rise. It's fairly significant. You see a lot of places that have fairly negative negligible impact, right? And you begin to have a sense that while we've been talking about uh, equity at a neighborhood and household scale, it also exists at a municipal scale. What's going to happen to these municipalities that are burdened with uh, reduced property uh, values or property taxes? It, it, it is very impossible that we can begin to see a vicious cycle where your property values begin to decline. You have less uh, tax rolls to, to implement adaptation measures, then you are more exposed to risk and then more people leave, right? And so that becomes a vicious cycle. What do you do with that? And other communities in this map might say, hooray for us. We can now benefit from development. I think um, uh, one community said about Boston, we don't need a seawall. Boston is our seawall, right? So we can play off and, and compete against one another. And so how do we think about uh, that kind of equity at a, at a municipal scale? So what you can begin to imagine and what is already happening on the ground is that some places that are able to afford it are able to build and uh, implement resiliency measures, whether that looks like a green park or whether that looks like a gray fortification of a building. And these uh, developments, on the one hand, it requires a fairly significant investment on the part of the city. Um, it also requires that the new construction measures oftentimes are going to be high end in order to pay off those kinds of investments or even if you build a park that's not directly you know benefiting an individual household it's going to then make the development behind it much more attractive to new people who want to come in new development projects that can go in and that kind of development project is not likely to be one that is affordable at the same time you have other communities that are in down markets like Troy, New York, where uh, the rising flood insurance rates are already causing people to worry that um, they're going to have flood insurance foreclosure and therefore a kind of economic collapse far ahead of when sea levels directly come over the city. And other places that are attractive because they're on higher ground are beginning considered for climate gentrification. And that's both within a region as well as across the country. So people are looking at the Rust Belt, for instance, as an attractive place to invest. 
So this is the, the landscape of the dynamics that we're facing moving forward. And so I, uh, you know, the talk we're talking about today is municipal budgets. And I'm going to go through um, a, a case that we did for Hull. Um, but the, the thing that I want to emphasize here is to push against the idea of like, what is the underlying problem that we're trying to respond to? Every municipal uh, government you talk to, their primary barrier that they cite will be, we don't have enough funding to address our climate adaptation needs. We need more funding. And that funding, most likely, they want to come from the state or the Fed. Or other times, uh, they may be able to generate their own fees and revenues. But I want us to think about what is the underlying reason, first of all, that we have gotten ourselves in this condition where we continue to build in places that are at risk and that now need more funding, infrastructure, and other wise to protect. And if we continue to receive funding for those kinds of protections, are we not continuing to go down this path of a perpetual cycle where we have to continue to develop in an at-risk place in order to fund more protections and, and on and on it goes. So a couple of years ago, um, I was fortunate to partner with MAPC on a course that I taught at Cornell, a workshop, and it, uh, it was about um, chiefly about Hull, which is for those of you who might not be from the Boston area on the Hull, it's like a peninsula, like a kind of a um, an arm that sticks out into Boston Harbor, and it is connected to the mainland areas of um, the region at the communities of Hingham and Cohasset. So uh, Hull was long a spit of land out there, and um, before colonialization, um, the Wampanoag native peoples used this area for clams and fisheries, and uh, it was not, I don't believe it was ever settled. Uh, when the Europeans came early on, it was um, an area where there was shipbuilding and ship fixing um, and some early industries and fisheries. And then in the 1950s and onwards, it became more of a recreational destination. It has the finest beach in New England with long and, uh, and beautiful. And there were many cottages that are built here um, that were never intended to be permanent. They were summer houses. And then as the, uh, as the housing market of Boston heated up, people began to settle here more permanently and convert those houses, those seasonal houses, to be permanent houses. But the condition of the risk and flood that led to this area never having been permanently settled a long time ago continued to be the same. And indeed, they are worse, except now it is one one of the most densely settled areas in, in all of New England. So when you talk to people at, in Hall and you look at their planning documents, you it's clear that this is a place that has a very strong sense of community. People here value it as a place that is still affordable in the Boston area where you can raise families and grow old, where you have a beautiful environment to live in and you have high quality of services and schools. Um, and it's, it's a very environmentally conscious community. They have two wind turbines and everything that you want, you would say, you know, this is the rule book for climate adaptation. They have done it. They have changed their zoning. They have put in education in their elementary schools. They've put in the wind turbines. They have tried dune restoration projects. They have all sorts of things that we have uh, recommended and they're finding that it's not enough. Because even now on a king tide or a high tide, schools have to let out early so that the school buses can get over the roads before they're inundated and flooded and get the kids home. So if you look at um, where Hull is, by 2030, these are maps provided by the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute. And you can see that at the, you know, at the higher end of projections, which we are currently on track to meet in terms of emissions and sea level rise, you can see that over time, more and more neighborhoods and more and more roads become inundated in this community. So the red line here is the main road that goes through Hull, for those of you who might know it. And at the very tip of this far end of the peninsula here is where the high school is located. So any disruption, uh, and then any disruption at the base where it connects to Hingham and to Cohasset, of course, impacts the ability to get into the community as a whole. And so you look at this community that is almost entirely built out, that is environmentally conscious, that's beginning to see fiscal stress 
and needs for greater um, intergovernmental transfers from the state and state aid. And you say, what are what should they do? Right? What should they do? And th environmentally conscious as they are, they have one last parcel left. I think it's about five acres in the middle of uh, of Hull. And they, even though they are environmentally conscious and aware of the risks, and even though this site sees the ocean on both sides, they have parcel. They have put that out for a bid to try to develop it into a tourism destination because they feel the need to diversify their tax base and generate more revenue. So um, MAPC and uh, and our workshop, we did a workshop looking at what are the options for a community that faces Hull. And I know that some of you may recognize the faces here um, on the far right. We have town manager Phil Lemnios um, with our uh, students. Um, and we went out and did visits and did a bunch of um, I would say like a fiscal, social, and a physical assessment of vulnerability in Hull. And then we considered what are the different scenarios of how you might then respond. So in one scenario, you might just say, it's like, don't do anything. Why bother? You know, it, we have no funding. The houses will collapse eventually. Nature will do its thing. If people don't care, they leave. Or, you know, we don't have funding. If you do nothing, what might happen? So if you do, if we do nothing, the houses that are permanently in the places that are going to be permanently inundated, if they begin to lose value, or if people abandon them, or if they collapse into the ocean or are demolished or bought out, we're looking at a potential fiscal impact of loss of 30% to 47% of the revenues in Hull as compared to very little impacts in Cohasset and Hingham. And it should be noted that Cohasset and Hingham are among the wealthiest of the suburbs in the Metro Boston area. And Hull is a, a much more working class community, although that is beginning to change. So if we don't think that that's acceptable, because with the loss of budgets, it's also a loss of the services and, and schools and all of the rest of it, then what might we do? So another option is to do a mega protection, build a harbor barrier. That's been under consideration, as I think all of you in Boston are aware of. And you'll see one of the options has his arm coming down across the bottom of Hull. And when Hull people found that out, they said, are you insane? How could you even think about putting a gigantic seawall between our last row of houses and the beach? We didn't come here to live against a, you know, the great wall of, of Hull here. And moreover, it's been uh, the report itself done by UMass Boston through cold water on the plan saying that it was infeasible, overly costly, physically impractical. And then a question, of course, is who's going to, to fund that option. Uh, or you might consider smaller seawalls and sand dunes, and we consider that. We talked to many people uh, locally who pointed us to examples where that already has been underway. And there's a number of challenges here. For one, uh, Massachusetts no longer permits new seawalls, so you can only rebuild or um, make higher existing seawalls, but you can't add new seawalls. Uh, where people have tried sand dunes, that has been shown to have even opposition from households for various reasons, um, or that it might be pushed out uh, and washed out. And the other major consideration is that with uh, sea level rise, the water tables themselves are going to increase and to, to rise from the bottom up. So a seawall doesn't necessarily solve that challenge. You could also have microprotection and elevation, which is to say you could surround your infrastructure facilities with small seawalls and you could elevate each individual house and then you try to nourish the beaches and you build out existing lots, try to fend as you go um, and take a micro approach and that's one of the three uh, scenarios that we considered. You might also try to accommodate and retrench to say, OK, those high uh, flood areas, we could pull back from those and then densify the surround the remaining sites. And this is um, a, a possibility if you were to demolish some of the existing development within Hull and then rebuild much more densely upon those and those areas. So redevelop those to try to accommodate and house that. Um, or you could try to move people out and densify surrounding areas. And obviously, all of these have immense social considerations as well. And then finally, you might say, well, let nature do its work. And maybe we should make this part of the Harbor Islands. What if we bought out half the town that's going to be flooded or the entire town? Because you can't really leave half the tax base and then 
full charge on services, police, force, schools, you can't just give half of those things. It would be very difficult to sustain a community that way. So maybe we should buy out the entire community and turn it into a park. And so my task to the students was to say, how much would each of these things cost? And what would the costs and benefits of these kinds of scenarios be? Um, given that, you know, these are the existing goals that the community has, which of these would meet their goals? So if you do a a wall. We're looking at a $10 billion fee. Of course, this is um, across the entire region. It does defer your need to adapt. You could live there for a while more. It will sustain your services because everything is protected. Your tax rules do not change. Um, it's not clear what the impact of affordable housing would be. But of course, the environmental quality is a, a problem. And currently, seawalls adding them is illegal. And there's a lot of community opposition. And moreover, it's not clear who is going to pay for that $10 billion when every other metro area also wants their own $10 billion seawall. If you elevate, and we just estimated the cost of elevating all the flood prone houses and elevating all the major roads, we're looking at a bill of potentially somewhere around 300 to $600 million. It's likely more than that when you account for water, electricity, and all the other businesses and other things. Um, and this seems like a much smaller bill to pay, um, but it also puts a greater burden on those households um, to change and elevate their homes. And that is especially is hard for our elders who are living on fixed income and who need to be able to get into their house without necessarily, you know, going up two flights of stairs. Um, and so there is, even though this seems as a whole, a much smaller bill, it is also increasingly unaffordable. So only those who can afford those greater investments are only are going to be doing that. And so that changes, even if you want to stay it seems inevitable that a change in the community is going to be happening. Um, and also, is that how we want to spend our collective resources, that we spend $600 million, you get to 2100 and you say, OK, we've got another six feet to elevate. We spent $600 million not changing anything, just trying to make things higher. Is that how we want to spend our money? And the last is if we want to retrench to buy out and to redevelop or to buy out people and move them elsewhere. There's a loss of home and community. Um, there's potential for improved services depending on how you move people, um, but gentrification issues are not managed. You still ha you have the benefit of a waterfront potentially, um, but how do you deal with those community impacts? And the current policies and funds really don't enable this kind of approach, which redevelopment um, or, uh, you know, like um, different policies would allow you to consider how to redevelop as a whole, like land readjustment, those kinds of strategies, they're not really enabled in state enabling legislation. So um, it's a very challenging thing to do. So I think that we are stuck in a hard place between a rock and a hard place for our different communities. When we're asking some of our hardest hit places how to adapt and the question of funding comes up, what are really the choices? Are we asking for state funding? Are we asking them to tax more? What can we do? And what are the different envelopes of opportunities? So I'm gonna talk here and maybe give a bit of push as an academic to saying we need to be really thinking about this as a region I am speaking to you uh, from MAPC. Um, so we have to think about how to address these as a region rather than asking each individual municipality to find the funding to plug the hole in their wall before the water comes over. So some of the existing mechanisms, whether you're looking at it from this UMass Boston report or from NOAA, which just issued this, I think, last week, is a basically um, a traditional set of funds, and some of them are a bit more innovative, like green bonds, resilience bonds, cap bonds. Uh, but these are the traditional ways in which we think about raising revenue through funding, which is free, like grant from somebody else, or financing, which you have to pay back. Right. So these different buckets of funding, they all are in some way predicated on continued growth within that place that's getting the funds, because you have to be able to then pay back those fees, especially if it's around financing, right? So if you get a bond to pay for infrastructure, that presumes that you are going to have sustained revenues to pay back those bonds. And if you're making more investments in a place that you, have, you imagine that place is going to have to pay uh, even more. So your revenue base needs to somehow compensate for the payment of those bonds. And the challenge of some of these communities that are facing 
permanent inundation is that that's not a feasible strategy, especially given the small land area of a lot of our coastal municipalities and the built out nature of them. There's not a lot of places for them to retreat to. So the expectation that these financial instruments are going to allow our municipalities to overcome it or that there's going to be some slush fund that a willing state or federal government is going to provide is unlikely because there's just so many coastal communities that require this funding. And so if we're going to think about how, if, if like the white horses are not going to come or the, the cavalry can only come to a limited extent, how can a region like Boston begin to think about addressing this um, itself with the resources that it has, the land resources, the financial resources, the human resources that already exist in this region? So I'm going to share a little bit, um, this is not wholly a regional scale, but it is uh, the kind of thinking that I think might um, that might help us, and then I'm going to open it up to questions and answers. This was a presentation that I made for the, oh dear, they used to be Boston Harbor Associates. I think now it's Boston Harbor or something else. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I just presented to them, um, and I'm sorry for forgetting the, the, uh, the new name here, but um, they were concerned with this area that's in East Boston, where the uh, the city is thinking about changing the port designation. And the question is, what do we do with this land? How do we change the designation? And so one is to say, why don't you just turn it into Fan Pier, which is what it looks like across the water. And you know that this model works because you see it physically in place over there. You get high-end a waterfront. It's going to pay a lot of taxes. You can put in some form of resilient design that will stave off the period of uh, climate impacts for some period. You probably were going to cause some level of gentrification because this kind of wealthy development always does. You can put in a few affordable housing units, uh, inclusionary housing, but it probably isn't going to be that much. And the question is, how long and for what social impacts? And the other option that we commonly see is then we say resist. Maybe the poor folks should win. They should resist, like have NOAA, which is the neighborhood, um, neighborhood something for affordable housing. I apologize, uh, COVID brain here. Um, and you say we are going to fight and pr uh, preserve affordable housing. We're going to preserve the existing residential fabric. And we want public investment in our existing communities. And this is a best outcome for the people who already live there. But it doesn't necessarily address uh, the broader housing shortage in the Boston area. It doesn't address the city's general requirement for increased tax rolls. Um, and of course, it requires some level of political progressivism to ensure that these are the priorities that are implemented. And I think the question isn't necessarily just how do we fix this particular area, right? The question really is how do we want to maximize the number of people who can live in places that allow working class, middle class people to thrive and even, yes, get rich uh, off of climate change or under climate change, right? Who owns this land? Who profits from it? Who controls decision making? Um, and so what about changing those financial pictures to think about could a, a CDC or other kind of community organization or a cooperative or a land trust own this area and help finance and develop it and that they whatever gentrification accrues accumulates to the people who live there you know you could have a community investment or a community improvement district which some uh, cities in the united states have tried rather than a business improvement neighborhood and have those investments benefit the people who currently live there the city might still get its taxes maybe it's a land lease maybe it becomes a community rights um, but then the question is also you're still developing within this site that is fairly at risk. Uh, another option might be to consider land readjustment or transfers of development rights. You know, I, th I think I see uh, Anthony Flint from um, the Lincoln Land Institute here, and they have explored in depth land readjustment models from around the world. And it is widely used both in the global north and the global south from places as diverse as Japan and uh, Germany to um, Jakarta and elsewhere to say, what if we own this area as a whole, as a community, but we just move things around? And this is a, 
of the scheme in Hull where you say you scrape off the development and then you build twice as tall on the remaining half, but then you make a park off of the, the, the places that you vacated. So writ large, can this model help us find ways to develop and to build housing um, that also allows people to migrate or to adapt as a community? Because that's one of the chief things that people resist is losing that sense of community when you're asking them to, to leave. And existing programs basically give individuals a buyout, a set of funding, and then you have to find your own way in the market. And when you do, everybody disperses and we're really left without that sense of community. So whether it's transfers of development rights, how can we think about that across municipalities or within municipalities, but also across municipalities that would allow places to actually share in the revenue and share in the development? And then finally, are there schemes in regional housing, regional tax sharing that we need to be thinking about? Not only with six feet of sea level rise, are we going to have housing challenges in the Boston area, but we're going to be seeing that all over the United States, in Florida, in our, all over the different parts of the world. And those are going to be causing massive uh, migratory challenges and my, massive housing crunches that we need to address. So we not only need to respond to the current housing shortage, but the future housing shortage. Where should that go? And how can we help use the additional funding that comes from the housing production to actually help some of our communities begin to think about in the long term potentially shrinking and declining with grace? Because, in, for instance, in Louisiana communities, when they finally broached those communities and they were afraid they, you know, what the communities would say, they said, we know we can't be here forever. We know we won't be here in 100 years, but we want to know how we can leave and be made well and not be um, not be made to suffer and really become extra vulnerable as a result. And so we need to be thinking about that at our, our municipal scale as well. And so in conclusion, I would just say that um, on top of the existing wonderful work that Boston and MAPC and the state has been thinking about is to push us to not only work collectively to help each individual municipality, but actually begin to think about the region as an integrated whole, as an integrated land resource um, and tax resource, and to develop regional housing plans that account for those kinds of future climate impacts, to marry the kind of innovative, crazy, living with water, housing boat Venetian Canal style of innovation thinking on the design side with the innovation and boldness and creativity on the land policy side. And finally, that of course, in all of this, we have to empower marginalized groups um, as primary beneficiaries, as uh, innovators in their own right to have thought leadership, um, and as people who have a real stake in the land and uh, uh, housing resources moving forward. All right, with that, I will open it up to questions and answers. Thank questions you so are much, for sure. Linda. Answers, not assured. <laughs> right, we'll see, we'll see about answers. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. And we've already had a, a number of really excellent questions that are in the chat and on, I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. I'm gonna take my moderator prerogative and ask one question just to get us started and then we'll move on to some questions from the chat. I was particularly wondering, and you spoke to this somewhat in the, the scenarios there at the end of, of different ways that we could work to address these challenges. Early on, you mentioned how in, I think, the Boston region, there have been discussions and questions of you in particular around, you know, if we if we don't give in to what the developer wants to do here, and, you know, if we don't require more and keep them here, there's a good chance that if we do ask them, you know, to build up five feet or put in some more infrastructure, or put in some more nature-based solutions, then they'll say, never mind, and just go on to another municipality who might not. And it seems like a lot of those kind of more coordinated efforts or, you know, approaches that you were talking to later would help to mitigate some of those concerns. But I just, being the, a regional planning agency and having a lot of cities and towns here on, on the call, I was hoping you could speak a little bit to any thoughts you have around the role that regional coordination among municipalities can play in helping to alleviate that issue and starting to work a little more cohesively together? That's a great question. And, um, you know, the, it, it's very hard in this country to work effectively as a region, uh, given the very weak regional powers that we have given our agencies and to ask them to do something more. Uh, but I think it is, uh, you know, groups like the Metro Mayors Coalition are notable examples where um, those coordination and sometimes cost sharing are perceived as benefits. Um, I suppose at, a, at the MAPC level or at the uh, Metro Mayors Coalition level, you could have uh, agreements 
that you could sign on to uh, where you say we're not going to change. It's just, uh, you know, we, we all agree that all development in the floodplain should elevate to a certain level. Uh, Southeast Florida, for instance, has done something like that. They have a compact that they ask municipalities to sign on to, but they can't make a municipality sign on to it. So some 20, 30, maybe by now 40 municipalities have signed on to it, but it doesn't necessarily even mean anything. Like I've talked to a planner there who said, yeah, my mayor signed it, but does he even remember that he signed it? Certainly not when he's making a permitting choice about what to put on the, the coast. So I think ultimately, you know, you're looking at a state building code and changing those kinds of hard, um, hard code. So maybe the greatest power of an MAPC type coalition would be to have the advocacy power and the um, and the I think creating the platform for dialogue between developers and municipalities. I think recently, right, there was codes that developers really heavily pushed back on on the mitigation side uh, in the state, and it's a question of can you. Uh, sufficiently address those fears and concerns up front so that you're more likely to get a deal passed, right? In some ways, it increases the cost of development, but what deals can you then make around state provision of housing support, tax policy, or other things that would make it possible for developers to be also at the table? Or, or you know, I think what um, the Regional Plan Association talked about in their fourth plan for the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region was thinking about how do we begin to densify those areas that currently are outside of the reach of transit. There are a lot of places that have no train lines, for instance, and that could have TOD potential, but then make it easier and to soften the regulations so that as of right development can happen in a more streamlined way to bring developers to the table to make affordable housing production actually easier. So I think there are opportunities for those kinds of conversations. Thanks, Linda. And that certainly resonates about, you know, bringing developers to the table to find more ways of, you know, advancing in affordable housing, working to get resilience as part of the building code, bringing communities together to try to have more consistent um, kind of requirements around developing, especially in vulnerable areas. Um, let me move to some of the, the great questions that we've had in the chat. Here's one that, what is your view on the land value capture rationale for having developers and landowners contribute money for building resilience as the new cost of doing business? And this kind of speaks to some of what you were just getting at. For years, developers have enjoyed the windfall, have enjoyed the windfall of taxpayer provided infrastructure. Those days are gone, are they not? Oh, great question. I don't know if those days are gone. Um, we are about to have a major infrastructure bill, and it feels like because of the push for urgent projects and COVID restoration and having shovel-ready projects that quite a lot of business as usual will go into how those infrastructure projects are, are going to happen. So I guess maybe not the immediate period, but maybe speaking a bit further out into the future, I think that um, internalizing those costs is is very important. I, I am not sure how we begin to change the broader capitalist model around that um, because Internalizing those costs, yes, you can make them pay. They simply will internalize the costs for housing and where that funding uh, gets passed on to. So the implications for what kinds of developments get built and what kinds of uh, housing is affordable to people doesn't necessarily get solved, solved uh, by this model. So I think the state um, intervention is quite important in in changing the, I don't know, the land availability question also and the ownership question, right? So if I think about like in the Southeast Florida model where uh, developers are beginning to move inland and Southeast Florida has said, we want the developers to pay a fee, a resiliency fee. The, they either invest in the resiliency measures now or they have to pay a fee so that future times when we do have to invest in it, we have a fund so that they don't get off scot-free right now. Uh, but the kind of development that you see them building, one, it's in places like Little Miami, where they're displacing uh, affordable housing, right? You have to buy cheap and sell high. So they're trying to buy land that currently is cheap, that's on higher elevation, which in that case is places that, of marginalized communities. Um, and then they're building higher end uh, new develop. New development is always going to be somewhat more expensive. Um, and so the the capturing of their internalizing of the, the fees doesn't exactly solve that question. So for me, I think 
ultimately the question of who owns that land in order to preserve the affordability of it has to be part of the picture, not only the financial instrument by which you, you make someone pay for it. That makes sense. That's great. And I think there's been at least one or, or more other questions kind of getting at some of the other like local policy levers that could be used and would love your sense of what role zoning should play. One question was around, wouldn't a long-term plan to change zoning also reduce development or redevelopment in areas that will be or are impacted by sea level rise? But I think they also then recognize that that would, you know, while that would be an inexpensive lever to pull for the municipality, that wouldn't cost them anything to do that, it wouldn't address the lost tax revenue unless you know, possibly zoning was changed in, in neighboring communities as well. So any thoughts on kind of the role that zoning should play in this? I think different communities are, are um, in different places. So some communities are not so built out, you know, and so maybe changing the, the zoning for them, it will not be as impactful because with sufficient infrastructure investment and extension, you could imagine further development in other parts of their unbuilt communities. In existing communities that are built out um, or that are land constrained, it's harder to imagine how the zoning itself solves this without massive reconstruction of the city. So it, uh, to me, I, I don't know that we're there yet, but it seems to me that at some point, I, I mean, I, I feel like people recognize this, but they don't necessarily talk about it a lot, is the future mergers and consolidation of some of our very small coastal municipalities. So New Hampshire last year passed legislation that said it permits coastal communities that are really impacted by climate change and sea level rise to engage in a partial or full merger and consolidation in order to address that. And we've seen other places where in, um, I think it's in Long Island, Mastic Beach dissolved back into the broader county because they couldn't make the infrastructure finance uh, pencil out under sea level rise and all the floods that they were having. So I think that in some way changing the geography, right? I mean, it's it's rationally one can imagine if you cut a pie into all these different holes and you say each hole has to stand on their own, each cupcake has to stand on their own two feet, you're going to try to maximize as much as possible all the development that you can within that circle. And if you want them to change it, you have to change the underlying base within which they're making those choices, which makes a bigger cupcake, a unified cake, a giant sheet cake, I don't know what it is, or spreading the icing in some way so that people actually are able to say, okay, I won't develop here, but I can still have, uh, still have, you know, resources. So the conversation in Hull, and I, I should say that it was a very sensitive topic and it was not one that was open to the public. They did not want us talking to the community. They were doing a whole social vulnerability assessment at that same time. But the conversation between the like Phil Lemnios and um, the yeah, Hingham and Cohasset planners began from a, com a like a conversation that was like, you guys have never liked us, you never cared for us. When we go to your communities, you never you know invite us. You know a kind of very distant relationship that was a conflict. You know I don't think you're going to help us for anything. To one at the end where by looking at this reality of the fiscal constraints, they arrived at a position that said. Actually, you know, Hull is, uh, and I, I don't, you know, this, the, where I'm talking about internal planning conversations is not like policy by any means, right? The conversation was like Hull recognizing, wow, you know, Hull, uh, Hingham recognizing that Hull is like a barrier beach for them. They want them to do well. They want the people to do well. They want their environments to do well. And historically, they claim they were one municipality, and they're right now trying to integrate their water infrastructure systems across those three communities. It's not impossible to imagine at the at at some future point, maybe you say we integrate our water first, and then maybe we integrate our school districts. And then maybe at some point, it becomes a much more integrated whole. And then it is more possible to imagine housing production or school systems and taxes actually penciling out. Now, should that happen, realistically, because of the, the differential in those two communities of housing costs, is it those two communities? Is it two communities? Or should it be at the scale of 50 communities or 100 communities? I mean, I think that is part of where, uh, if we're going to bring more modeling prowess to, this, uh, to these questions, I would like to see more integrated uh, analysis that is not just was whole physically uh, analyzing physical risk, but actually all of these different kinds of land tax and environmental social risks. 
There's one question around, you know, does part of the solution include the native tribes from the study area? Do you think, I, mean, I think that could be directed to either Hall of Hingham Cohasset or more generally at the study areas that you've looked, le looked at, um, you know, should, should that be part of the solution? Great question. And I really regret that in that workshop, we didn't spend more time thinking about um, where are the where, where's the tribal role in all of this? If this used to be Wampanoag land, should it go back? Should there be land back? I mean, we did this a couple years ago and land back was not even at that time prominent, though I should have you know, thought about what, more about that. Um, I think there's tremendous opportunity to think about if we're seeding a coastline, what happens to that? And others have done much more thinking about that, like AR Siders and, and others who say, you know, we should make this to be our new national sea seashore. Um, that if we're going to take development out or retreat from the shore, what if we don't just say we leave behind abandonment, but actually leave behind a vision that we want to grow towards? I mean, uh, how we pay for that, we right now, like 80% of, um, of like buyout sites from FEMA's 40,000 parcels are, are not restored, or actually only, only I should say only 7% of them are restored. So how do you get funding to actually restore and not just leave the sites? Um, but as we do that, I think it's an interesting question to say, could that open up an opportunity to have land back for tribal communities to say, this is a place that we want to have new stewardship of a different nature. I, that should be part of the conversation. I think it is, I don't, I hope under this administration, there's more opportunities for that. Um, but if you look at Ile de Jean Charles, which is one of the first places where they've done whole resettlement of a community, that was on tribal land of a tribal community. And they got a lot of um, Bureau of Land Management funding to relocate. I think it's like $800 million from the, um, actually it wasn't land management. It was the National Disaster Resilience Competition funding. Um, so they got $800 million to like move that whole uh, community. And at the end of it, they said, oh, but you can't have that land where your your tribe used to be. Once you move, you just lose all connections to where you were. And that was a huge shock to those communities who, by the way, also have already been resettled multiple times over the course of their history to say, now we're going to lose these ties to this particular piece of land that has a lot of meaning to us. So um, we are, and then you have like Dakota pipelines. So and not only are we far from, you know, giving land back, but we're actually not even stopping to do harm on the existing land that belongs to tribal communities. So there's a lot of dialogue, I think, that needs to happen. But many tribal communities are in the leadership of climate thinking. And if you're tired of mainstream adaptation thinking, they have uh, developed very um, diverse non-mainstream, non-traditional ways of looking at these challenges that looks at seven generations, that looks at environmental knowledge, and that can be an important complement to the work that cities are doing right now. That's so important. Thank you so much, Linda. And since I know that we're just about at, at 1.30, even though this conversation can go on for much longer, I didn't get to so many wonderful questions around transfer of development rights and flood risk pro protection programs and other budget impacts and things about the study area. Um, but we do encourage you to look into Linda's research um, to obviously, you're welcome to view this um, recording again. We'll post it publicly, um, as I think has been noted in the chat. And I just want to turn it back. Um, let's see, Ella, if you don't mind bringing up the slide about our next speaker series. And while she's doing that, if everyone can give a virtual round of applause to Linda for a wonderful presentation today and giving us so much food for thought, there's so much more work to be done. Um, but it's it's you know it's it's wonderful to see all the thinking that has gone into this topic so far, and, and already kind of how we're starting to think about how to coordinate better together. So next up, in about two months' time, um, we'll be welcoming Jacqueline Patterson, who's the director of environmental and climate justice at the NAACP. It promises to be a really intriguing session as well, and we hope that you. You all will join us then. And for today, I just want to say thank you again to Linda. Thank you again to all, all of my colleagues at MAPC and to the Bar Foundation. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great to be with you.